The purpose of this podcast is to educate and inform. It is no substitute for professional care by your doctor or your qualified healthcare professional. Never disregard or delay professional medical advice because of something you've heard on this podcast or in any linked material. Guests who speak on this podcast express their own opinions, experience, and conclusions. Dr. Shirley neither endorses nor opposes any particular opinion discussed on this podcast. The views expressed on this podcast have no relation to those of any academic, hospital, practice, institution, or other entity with which Dr. Shirley may be affiliated. Welcome to Forever Fab, the podcast on fashion, the art of living, and all things beauty. This podcast is curated by Dr. Shirley Medea, MD, as the definitive source of holistic wellness through beauty. The Forever Fab podcast values truth and authenticity. We encourage our guests to show up exactly as they are, as the best version of themselves. Please note, this podcast episode contains adult language. Thank you and enjoy. Welcome to Forever Fab, the podcast dedicated to fashion, the art of living well, and all things beauty. I'm your host, Dr. Shirley Madera, the founder of Holistic Plastic Surgery and your purveyor of this definitive source of living a beautiful life. In this podcast, we like to have intelligent and fun discussions <laughs> around some of the things that we love and that move us with joy, namely fashion, art, wellness, and the many faces of beauty. We keep it refreshing and real, educational but entertaining, scientific but always fantastic and fabulous. This week's episode specifically is dedicated to beauty. And my guest is Ella Gorgla. Ms. Gorgla received her Bachelor's of Science in Engineering from The Ohio State University with numerous honors, may I mention, a master's degree from the London Business School, and, as if that weren't enough, and an MBA from Columbia Business School with additional studies at Yale University. Can we say big brain? <laughs> Originally from Monrovia, Liberia, Ella ultimately established herself as a force for positive change in New York City. In 2010, she started the e-commerce site, iEla, with the mission to, quote, solve a problem that most women have, a closet filled with clothing that, that they seldom use. Amen to that. She has since moved on to establish herself in the beauty industry. She most recently served as executive director of strategic initiatives and corporate innovation for Estee Lauder Companies, May. Prior to that, she served as the executive director of global retail for MAC Cosmetics, where she launched innovative retail concepts around the world and actually led the entry of MAC Cosmetics into Ulta Beauty. So it was in that space, in the beauty space, that Ella developed her form of brand activism. I'll call it brand activism. She believes that, and I quote, Accountability and commitment start at the top, at the highest levels, and the role of diversity, equity, and inclusion have to be reimagined at those particular higher levels. In an Essence Magazine interview, she has also been quoted as saying that the beauty industry is a global industry, and Black people are helping to drive that consumption, but yet we're still underrepresented as owners. Ella is currently the co-founder of 25 Black Women in Beauty, and it's a movement that aims to celebrate, elevate, and promote Black women in beauty. Ella is here with us today via Zoom to tell us about her journey and her efforts to help make the beauty industry a more beautiful, diverse, equitable, and inclusive space. Welcome, Ella. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Thank you for that um, wonderful introduction. <laughs> It's all truth. It is all truth and all reality. So first question, tell me about your, your journey, your history, your childhood. Um, what did you want to be when you grew up? Yeah, I think what's, what's interesting is that um, 
growing up, I actually wanted to get into fashion. I wanted to be a fashion designer. My mom would um, like so often and I was surrounded by by that craft and I would like draw and I imagine myself one day like going to fashion school and going you know studying in Paris and, and <laughs> my own line um, I as you noted I, I mean I'm, I'm Liberian I'm you know West African and unfortunately that life that particular um, field is not an option if you're an African um, in an African household you know you have to be an engineer, a lawyer, a doctor, et cetera. Yeah. Um, and I actually ended up, you know, when I went to Ohio State, I started out as pre-med. I wanted to be a doctor. Um, hey. Yeah, I know, interestingly enough, but um, it's, a, it's a difficult field <laughs> and it takes a no lot no of doubt. time. On many levels, sister, on many levels. Uh, I'm, uh, yes, I'm sure you can attest to that. Um, and, um, and But I, I knew that, I mean, I was good at the sciences and I knew that I wanted to occupy that space. So mm. I switched over into engineering, which um, really I loved. I really, I did enjoy it. And it was a launching pad for me to do um, all types of work, whether, and I, and I knew that working in engineering with that level of rigor, that whatever I decided to do at some point in my career, I would just be able to do it, right? I would have sort of the intellectual capacity if I wanted to go into law, if I wanted to go into research, I think engineering was a solid foundation for all of that. Um, and so, um, yeah, and I, and I really created a community. I think my, my time at Ohio State and being, um, I was president of NSBE. So for all the engineers out there, they know National <laughs> Society of Black Engineers. I mean, that was yes. my first real sense of community at that level. And, um, and I saw the power of community, being able to um, lean on people like yourselves. And um, yeah, and, and, and so um, engineering for me was, was the launching pad to do everything else that I wanted to do. I love that you thought that and believed that w having had that background and that education, that no matter what you did, you could do it. Mm -hmm. So I have two engineers, minimum, a few engineers <laughs> in my family, two of whom one went to, you know, worked at Xerox, the IBM. And what I learned mm -hmm. from their studying their path they're all about systems and processes. Yes. yes. <laughs> and then, so you love systems. And I, I do. And that's, and I think that's the value I tend to add. I mean, when I even like, when I went on to work at Mac, I mean, I was a systems engineer. I actually worked at General Motors for quite some wow. time on the shop floor. Um, I, then I went on to work at IBM um, doing a lot of systems design work. And not to like bore anyone, but I think systems and understanding processes, yes. that, that, that is a, um, a skill set that can be applied in so many different areas of your own life, whether it's just organizing your own life or actually solving problems, you know, everything can be broken down into its um, components it's, it's, um, with, within a given system. So yeah, I, um, I, I did enjoy it. I have no regrets whatsoever. Good. I'm going to say that you would have made a brilliant doctor because as physicians, obviously we study systems and processes and how the body works and, and how to organize our thoughts around yeah. diagnosis. So you would have been fantastic. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> I'm sure your parents are proud of you no matter what. Yeah. Now to a certain degree, we're all a product of our upbringing, right? Would you say? Yeah. And having been at least born, uh, I don't know how much time you spent in Liberia before you came to the States, but how did your background and your culture influence some of the decisions that you made? Yeah, I think, um, you know, I, I grew up in a traditional uh, Liberian household, you know, my, um, my father, my mom, um, both Liberian, both born in Liberia, grew up in Liberia. So I'm truly like a first generation you know, um, American in many ways. I mean, I was born here in the States, but I did live in Liberia for about, um, about eight years, I would say. Mm -hmm. And I think that the, you know, um, the, the discipline, you know, that, that, that discipline to, to I don't know, for, both from an academic standpoint was so crucial to our upbringing. Um, it was, you know, my, my mom was never truly satisfied with my grades unless I, it was like the best. 
And um, there were always high hopes and expectations. And I knew that um, education was, was that pathway for me to start building generational wealth. And, um, and so I think it was, it was fully ingrained in, in the community for sure. I definitely think that that's a cross-cultural concept, if you will, mm -hmm. that education um, is the pathway for transgener you know, generational wealth or building and creating gener generational wealth. So yeah. I grew up with similar, you know, sort of teachings and, and that's the one thing, you know, allegedly that can't be taken away from you, you know, at yeah. least in your head. It could be changed, but it could be changed. Yes, right. but yes, it, it, it stays with you. It stays, it stays with, you. with you. Now, having had such an exceptional education as you have, um, particularly in global um, economics and business, mm -hmm. um, not to mention, obviously, or mentioning also the engineering, but what you said you initially wanted to go into fashion, but then after you, the engineering degree, and then after your MBA and having studied at the London Business School, what were your plans to use or what, how are you going to use this business acumen and this knowledge base of, of business and global economics? Yeah, you know, I, I mean, there was a time in my in my educational formation that I thought that, you know what, um, I, one day, because I, you know, I worked at Ernst & Young and, you know, did the whole consulting thing, you know, one day I'll become a partner. That's, that's what I'll do. Or one day I'll become a president of a Fortune 500 company. I used to, you know, collect the Fortune magazines and yeah. see Ann Fudge from, uh, from Kellogg and uh, General Mills rather. Um, and like, okay, this is what I aspire to be. Um, but I, I, you know, I think as I delved more and more into sort of the corporate reality, I realized that, you know, for, within me, there was a certain level of innovation and there was a certain bug, which, which was calling me to create. Mm -hmm. And I, I started to realize that, you know, I, I loved creating. I, I love, I, I love starting stuff, <laughs> you know, and, and then it turns out I was reasonably, reasonably good at starting stuff and creating momentum and yeah. having, getting people to gather around an idea. Um, and, um, and so that's why I started to look at my entrepreneurial options as well. Um, so that, that, that led me to launch my first, um, uh, business, if you will, a com, And I think, going through that process of launching a business, raising capital, dealing with the swift highs and lows of a business um, was the best educational experience I've ever had, period, you know, outside of London, Columbia, uh, you know, Ohio State, the best learning experience, because, you know, it, it, it challenged who you were, which I think is part of your own formation, right? It kind of tested your ability to, to sort of to, to solve hard problems, you know, when, it, when there are no rules <laughs> in place, generally. So um, it, it was a fantastic um, experience. Your answer is so rich. I probably just thought of at least four or five different questions based on okay. the answer alone. But I'm going to choose one and, and yeah. let's um, talk a little bit about your .com, your e-commerce site, which I believe you called i dash l i i yes. correct? Yes. I -L -I, yes. I -L -I. So you had, and it was fashion. It was mm -hmm. a fashion e-commerce site. And your concept, I, I, correct me if I'm wrong, but your concept of reselling gently used but yeah. madly loved items was very much ahead of its time. I mean, how? Right, let me tell what? you. I know. Let me, let me tell you. And uh, oh my gosh, it, be, listen, it's, I, if you even knew the full story, you'll be, I mean, we were, we were ahead of our time. Yes. Right? I mean, we're definitely ahead of our time. We were, we launched in like back in 2009 before Instagram even launched. Yeah. And, and it was going well. I mean, people like, wow, this is great because I saw what you know people consider a white space in the market because eBay at the time was sort of moving away from their whole marketplace concept. It yeah. was focused on being like the Amazons of the world. Yes. And I'm like, but you know, but people still have all this this commodity in their closet that all right. this money that they're not doing anything with. Yes. So the whole concept was sort of a curated um, resale environment. Yeah. And um, you know, leveraging influencers, leveraging celebrities. We had you know Veronica Webb, who I, I believe you know. Um, you yes. know, she, she was like that's how I met her. So we would like partner with all these celebrities to re. We had we had Kanye West gave us a pair what? of shoes. Yes, and 
at the as we were peaking, I mean, we were on every major platform. You know, we were on the Today Show. We were. It was it was amazing, and um, we you know, and I think the I think the pinnacle, if you will, of it all was um, when Time Magazine had wow. to us as one of the top ten startups to watch, along with Warby Parker. Literally knew the guys from Warby Parker because we were all at the same event. Yes, and um, Group Me, which ended up being sold to Skype for eighty five million dollars. Oh yeah, it's it Yip It, which was like a trap. I mean, and then there was. Us. Yeah. And um, yeah, so we launched just before Poshmark. And so many, I mean, I would get calls from investors all the time. And um, even one investor said, you know, we're actually looking at something similar. And it turns out like the similar thing was Poshmark that they were. Oh. <laughs> so we were, I mean, it was, oh gosh, I mean, so many lessons learned. It was heartbreaking to have to wind it down. And largely because we just weren't able to raise the sort of capital needed <sighs> to fund it. And even How though- How frustrating is that? Beyond frustrating. It was, it was, it, you know, it was, it was very, very frustrating. Yeah. And, but I'm very thankful to the investors I did have um, mm -hmm. who backed me at a time when it was just unheard of for, a, I mean, we raised like just over 1.5 million, which was unheard of yeah. at that time. Um, mm -hmm. But um, a lot of good lessons learned. I mean, actually, I, I it, everything I, I do feel like things worked out for for the best, mm -hmm. you know, because that 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 type of business model is actually quite difficult to sustain. Like you have to deal in significant volume in order for it to make sense. Yeah. Um, you need to and be profitable. You, and you have to be profitable, and it's difficult to get to profitability if you. So I think everything sort of played itself out. But, you know, I look back on us like I could have been the next Poshmark. Quite oh, really. we been bigger. Right. Yeah, but they just went public. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, oh, my gosh. Very oh, interesting. Yeah, so yeah. I, I was reading through your bio and when I just gave it some extra thought and I thought, wait a minute, there are plenty of Ayelas, you know, now. Yeah. Yes. yes look yes. at them now. So so what happened? And you mentioned highs and lows and you, you, you answered this to a certain extent, but there's so many challenges, right? Not just, not only launching a new business, mm -hmm. but launching a new business as a black woman or, or yeah. a woman of color, person of color. So yeah. we'll, we'll talk about some of that later in the, um, in the podcast, but get back to, let's get back more to you specifically. Um, what was your first experience in beauty and how did that experience um, affect or affect your wanting to enter into that field? Yes, um, I would say that, I mean, I've always just loved products, right? I'm like a product <laughs> junkie. And for as long as I can remember, I mean, I was always the one willing to spend premium amounts of money. <laughs> yes, on products. Like, yeah, yeah, my best yeah. friend, she'll be like, why are you spending $30 on a body wash? Yeah. And I'm like, that's not even that pricey, quite frankly. <laughs> <laughs> you know? Because I'm worth it. <laughs> yes, because I'm worth it. I love it. I want to smell good. Um, and so I, I I had the love of it. And I had like sort of my favorites. You know, I would go to the Mario Badescu yes. in Midtown um, when I first moved to New York. I'm like, this is awesome. Yeah. So I, 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 you know, my introduction was really as a consumer and, and you know, and developing a love for, for all of these brands. And, um, and, you know, traditionally my background was a consultant. And so when I was asked to um, consult on a project at Mac, that was like my first, first official entry into like the industry itself. Yes. Um, and, um, and that was, I mean, and, and that was a, you know, interesting le a learning experience. I mean, you, you, it's, it's, it's almost like, going in to work for like a Chanel, like you, yeah. you, you love it so much. You have your ideas of what that world is like. And, yes. and yeah. And, um, and so it, it took, it took learning, you know, a great deal of learning for me. Um, and I think what was interesting is that my background was even was a bit unusual for a brand um, like yeah. that, a beauty brand, um, because I was an engineer, I yeah. was like a process person. Right. And but it turns out that's exactly the kind of skill set they needed. They needed right. someone who could take a concept from con, you know, from idea to launch. Yeah. I, like, I could do that in my sleep. I could. Right. <laughs> and I got this. <laughs> I can do that. No problem. 
So that's how I got into really launching strategic initiatives for the brand and, and just working on like interesting stuff. But that, that was my entry. So that was like back in two, 2014. 2014. Okay. So you had these aspirations or at least expectations, you know, Mac global beauty brand, Mm -hmm. and you had these ideas of what perhaps it could be, should be, would want it to be. And then perhaps, and and I'm paraphrasing here, but I'd like you to fill in the the gaps. And perhaps you realize that along the way, Mm -hmm. it really wasn't as pretty as you anticipated. Yeah. So when did you notice a lack of racial and ethnic parity, a lack of racial and ethnic parity in the industry. Yeah, you know, I think when I when I entered, um, it's 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 very easy, especially when you're in that honeymoon stage, right? Yeah, yeah. it's very easy to dismiss, you know, small slights, and yes. you're like, oh, it's no big deal. I'm here. Yeah. I'm working for this brand. It's it's no big deal. But it, I mean, for me, it, it actually took some time for me to say, wait a minute, there's something isn't quite right here. You know, it, it just seems unusual because, you know, I was like, I, I worked on Wall Street. I know what it's like to sort of work in environments where I don't see a lot of people like myself and I'll work my way up, blah, blah, blah. Right. Right. And, um, and I would say that probably after, after a couple of years, I mean, it's not like it happened right away. Um, Cause I think I made a lot of excuses right away. Um, and, um, but it, it happened probably within, within a couple of years, I just, I, I had to accept the fact that um, I just want to frame this properly. Yeah. I, I had to accept the fact that something wasn't quite, Right. Mm-hmm. And, and, and I, and I, it took me a while to get to that because a, you know, as a African, it's like, you know, we don't, tr- we don't necessarily talk about racism too much. It's all about putting your head down, doing the writing work it out. and writing it out and grinding it out. Um, and so it wasn't, it wasn't my, it wasn't something I was willing to go to. Mm-hmm. Um, but I think I started to feel like something just wasn't right. Not just, with with how I was interacting with you know with within you know the brand or just in the industry as a whole, but I saw the interaction. I saw how Black women were being treated, mm. and I became even I became more sensitive to that those indignities versus what I personally was dealing with. Right, right. Because I mean, because you saw this sort of lopsidedness. You mm-hmm. saw that. Like, it's almost like we didn't really recognize our worth and our value, right? Like, hey, listen, you are, I know, because that's, I'm charged to sort of study that, like, you're actually driving a great deal of consumption, you're driving influence, yet you are an afterthought, you know, or if you're not an afterthought, there are, you know, you know, constant microaggressions and just downright disrespect. And I just didn't feel comfortable with that, especially for a core group of consumers that was so that was that was driving consumption and growth within the industry. Yeah. So um so that that's that's when it, and it was it was it was difficult to have to actually accept that because it's almost like it's almost like you know you enter into a relationship and you have all these great expectations because he's like he has all these things on his resume and everything is supposed <laughs> to be perfect and then bam you were after like a couple of months after the marriage <laughs> you're like uh something doesn't feel right <laughs> so you had these experiences not well did you have them on the uh, internally within the organization or externally on the consumer end or both that you made these observations? Oh, I, I would, I, I would say both. I would say both. And I think on the consumer side, that's, I mean, definitely there, we were, we were often overlooked. I mean, if you think about it back in like 2014, no one was really doing shade range and talking about inclusive beauty or having, you know, black, you know, black models, right. or if it was a prestige brand, you weren't really seeing like brown skinned women. Right. That's true. So you definitely on the consumer. And that's why Fenty did so. Oh well. my gosh. That's why she killed it because she was unapologetic. Yeah. 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 It was, it, it was like such an, I, I almost want to say an easy thing, like, duh, of course we need more shade range, but nobody's paying attention. <laughs> right. Exactly. Well, if yeah. you know Miss Fenty, please let her know. I'd like to interview her on this podcast. <laughs> Just putting it out there, Ella. Yes. <laughs> 
So that being said, um, you, I presume you were sometimes like the only one, right? Either yeah. in the room or at your executive level level at the table. Yeah. And if that is the case, how did you ever feel undervalued? Because again, they hired you at a certain level to be able to help them systematically to be able to improve, you know, sales, um, how they look, perceptions, et cetera. So did you ever feel that even as the only one that your contributions were valued? How did you handle that? And and that's what, what was so difficult as well is that I knew like the company, the brand understood what I was bringing to the table because I kept getting more work. That's almost like the reward for doing good work, you know, like you get more. More, right. And, um, and, and I, you know, I, I knew that they valued my work. Um, But unfortunately, I think over time, the, the markers of sort of, you know, those rewards just weren't there. Like, you know, I, I wasn't getting promoted, which just did not make sense to me. Right. And, um, and, and then, you know, I just, I think, you know, I just wasn't being included in like key decisions, et cetera, et cetera. It was, I mean, it literally boiled down to this. Like if I were a white male with my credentials at the company, I would have, easily been an SVP, not even a vice president. I would have been an SVP. And, and also like with the work that I was doing and the impact block, you know, on and on and on. Right. Um, and so that was, that was the difficult part, but again, I always feel like even I go back to Iella and the fact that I, I didn't raise the capital that I needed. And even and then my experience within the industry, it's almost like, you know, um, you know, God has a plan, right? And I and I and as as, as I sit where I am today, I under I, I you know looking back, I understand. Yes. I don't understand why people behave the way they did, but I think at a higher level, yeah, I understand why things move the the way they did. You know, um, yes. yeah. I like to say um, everything in divine precision. Yes, we can't yes. predict. And some, and you, you don't even know, you, you can't, maybe you can't even plan for it, Yeah. but I agree with you. Everything yeah. is divine precision. Absolutely. I do. I do believe that. Given your experiences and the gratitude that you have for one thing leading to another, mm-hmm. whether good or bad, however you define good or bad, you, all of your experiences led you to co-found 25 Black Women in Beauty. Mm-hmm. Yes. And It is, if I may describe it as an intently or intentionally curated Mm -hmm. organization of which I am a proud member. Thank you so very much. (laughs) Now, when did you have your aha moment specifically to launch an advocacy group for women of color in beauty? When did that moment particularly specifically come when you thought, you know what, I'm good at this. I'm good at this. I have these experiences. It's time. Yeah, I think I think I just um, the the frustration, if you will, was piling up, and I felt like, you know, I I want to do good work. I want to be proud of my work, and I want to do impactful work. You know, like I I want to I just I want to do impactful work, and I want to operate my my life in a way that will make you know, people proud. And I, you know, and it, it so it, it kind of fell together. I, I, you know, I, I realized that, look, there's, we, we need to acknowledge ourselves. We need to acknowledge, you know, us as black women and our contributions and we need to celebrate each other. So when other people aren't seeing us, because quite frankly, in corporate, like sometimes you can be made to feel invisible, oh, yeah. you know, and it's like, well, but we see each other. Yeah. And we need to, instead of waiting for the accolades to come raining down from other groups, we need to celebrate ourselves, right? And we need to inspire one another and we need to understand our own power. I think that, I mean, that's, isn't that, I think Mandela says it. I mean, that's the challenge is that we lose our power because we don't ever realize that we have it. And um, I knew that I just wanted to do, I wanted to do good work and I wanted, and I, and I'm, you know, maybe the engineer in me, I like to also be very targeted. 
very focused. That's the engineer in you, Ella. Is that it? I don't know. I was like, my mom would say, why do you always talk sometimes like you're in a boardroom? I'm like, I don't know what you mean. <laughs> but um, I wanted to be intentional. Um, and um, and so it, it, it led me to do this work. And I have I have no regrets. And it hasn't been all like easy by any means, like, you know, doing the work and growing it and yeah. And, and, you know, there's been, there have been disappointments, quite frankly, it's, you know, there have been disappointments from even other black women, you know, which, which can be feel even weightier at times when you experience that. But I've made the decision and, and and there are other things in my life that, that have been happening that, that hopefully, you know, if all goes as planned, I can celebrate soon. But I also, um, I, I know that I just want to do work that will make, you know, my mom proud, will make, you know, just, you know, people proud, will make God proud, will make everybody proud. That's, that's my focus right now. And I always go back to that. And to make, to help make the world a more beautiful place. Yes, yes, absolutely. That's what I, that's what I say underlies my work. I yes. say I I feel that part of my purpose is to help make the world a more beautiful place. However, that's manifested. Yeah. Mine just happens to be with a needle and a scalpel, but yeah. um, <laughs> I hope it's also with my words and these interviews and the podcast. Yes. Yes, absolutely. Excellent. Ella, you are doing beautiful work. And again, I thank, thank, you. thank you for that. Now, why was it important for you to launch on Juneteenth on June 19th? Yes. You know, I think everything, I believe in stories and I believe that, you know, that, you know, the genesis of everything needs to have a real meaning. Mm -hmm. Um, And the the core of what we were doing was about, you know, sort of celebrating us. It was about liberation in a way. Mm -hmm. Um, And I thought Juneteenth um, was, was an appropriate date. Yeah. Good for you. And you mentioned something about um, sometimes uh, corporate and in corporate, in a corporate environment, um, you can sometimes feel invisible. Mm-hmm. Now, do you think in general that corporate beauty is failing the community of color or failing black women? Has it, gotten, know, it seems to me that it's gotten better, but what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I, I, there's, you know, it's, there's work to be done. And there, there's work to be done. There's a lot of work actually that needs to be done. <laughs> yeah. Um, the, the beauty industry is what, like a $600 billion plus industry. Yeah, Global serious. Giant. Yeah. Like, what, I mean, I don't think people always appreciate that. And you are coming into people's lives, into their homes at their most intimate, right? Yeah. Early in the morning when they got yeah. out of the shower. And, and now there's just, there's, there's a move towards beauty and wellness. Mm-hmm. And I think there's a, there's there's a real opportunity for more brands to be purpose driven brands. Yeah. And um and there's a, there's a much greater opportunity for the big conglomerates of the world to be more purpose driven. You know, and it's you you can do both. You can be profit driven and purpose driven. You don't have to choose. And um I just think that the world needs that desperately yeah. right now. Um and and ev- every interaction that I think companies have with their consumers, they need to try to make that a good interaction, right? To yeah. try to make the world a better place, make the individual yeah. a better, you know, better. And so I think there's opportunity for these brands to be more purpose driven. And there's certainly opportunities just, I mean, just like low hanging fruits, you know, yeah. for some of these brands, yeah. like, you know, some of the stuff that you just know aren't good, stop doing it, you know, yeah. <laughs> like, stop, you know, just stop doing that, you know, right. Um, yeah. I so just wonder for, um, yeah. if there's a, a, a bit of a, a disconnect, right? Um, you mentioned that you love, you know, certain brands and you love beauty. And I feel the same way. Like I get emotional about my moisturizer and especially my essential oils <laughs> and serums. I am emotional about them. Yeah. And um, if I hoard anything, it's probably beauty products. Like I am beyond the ultimate beauty consumer. Yeah. <laughs> um, but interestingly enough, or maybe ironically enough, there the brands, the uh, the corporations, the manufacturers, the, the businesses, they know that mm-hmm. they know we love beauty. They know the consumer loves the product or loves the brand, 
And yet it seems as if that love, that transference of love and and sort of um, greeting the consumer with open hearted love, like we love you. That's why we create yeah. this product. There seems to be a disconnect. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think part of it is, I think, a, I mean, A, just being unapologetic about love, right? I think, yeah. you know, I mean, just, and that's where the indie brands, I feel, are winning, right? Because yeah. they they don't have those sort of rules where, oh, yeah. we can't talk about love because yeah. love is somewhat of a spiritual thing. And what, right. what, what, what does that mean to a consumer? Yeah. Um, but I think... But yes, but they need to be, right? Because they have such a wide reach. Um, and that's why I love, like, I mean, that's my big thing right now is purpose-driven brands. We're actually, I just wrote a piece on this and we're going to be publishing it this week. You know, some of the top five purpose-driven brands that we love. Right. And how to become a purpose-driven brand. Um, and um, yeah, I think it's love. And and for me, you know, I think there, there are, because you're right. I mean, if you think about it, you know, with, with beauty and the oils and the events oh. of the oils and all that, there's this it's, virtual conversation. It's all about self-love. Yes. And self-love. Yes. Yes. It, it's, it's, I mean, there's so much, I mean, that's why I'm like, gosh, there's, there's so much opportunity for the industry to be a part of that self-love movement. Yeah. And um, so, yeah, that's why I think there's definitely more and more room for sure. Okay, so 25 black women yes. in beauty. There are way more than 25. There are far more than 25, yes. Far more than 25 black women in beauty. Yes. And um, how have you grown this collaborative networking organization? Yeah, it's, you know, part of it is, and, and, I, and I think it's, it's the application of um, just like, a, I mean, part of it is just like a growth strategy. The other part is just kind of luck. And then the other is just like, actually, it wasn't intentional. It just sort of happened. But um, I think with any time you're trying to grow something, it's always important, I believe, in starting small and kind of defining who you are and what you stand for and just really allowing the brand equity to gel. And you see a lot of larger companies, they, you know, they were founded that way. You know, they were founded with like sort of this core mission and from there the foundation uh, you know allowed for growth I think for us like you know our core founding was you know it was it was like a buy invite group we wanted to make sure like we had amazing women like yourself who were part of like the initial core of the group um, and, um, because they just helped to set the tone of, of who we are and what we stand for. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and then it's just, the other part was just, no one was really doing anything like that mm-hmm. at all. There's no, there was no professional organization out there for black women in beauty. I think now you sort of see that more and now you sort of see it happening in fashion as well. Uh-huh. But, um, but, you know, people talked about the issues, and I just, for me, I saw an opportunity to really create a platform around this. Yeah. And platforms are powerful. Communities are powerful. Yeah. And that's one thing, and that was a big learning from Ayala, is that the communities are, are a great way to help gel your brand and create like that brand equity and create like people who are truly committed to, to what it is you're doing. Um, and brands that, that are launched without any real community, it's almost like they don't have a core, like what's, what's the soul of the brand? What does it really stand for? And communities exist in different ways. They could be, you know, your consumers who are able to come together and, you know, you're able to sort of create community around your consumers. But, um, yeah, it started out, you know, part of it was definitely, it was, I invite super exclusive, you know, we had stuff in Beverly Hills in New York. We had like a wish list of people, all of whom would come to our dinners. And then there was just clearly a need to do it, um, to do more. And the press picked up on it, which also really helped. Yeah, that definitely really helps. Yeah. Well, I, again, I'm just really grateful that you decided to do this and it it came together. Yes. Partially from luck, but also for the most part organically, because again, If it's meant to be, it will be. It will be. It will be. Yeah. For whatever reason, it will be. So my mother um, often told me when I was a young, young girl, and she would tell this to me in French. But the translation is, "Tell me who your friends are, and I'll tell you who you are." Hmm. So I know, having met a number of the 
25 plus women, yeah. <laughs> black women in beauty that I'm in fantastic company. So thank you again. Thank you. Thank you. Now, uh, you mentioned earlier that there's some low hanging fruit that the beauty industry has maybe just not reaching for yet. Uh, mm -hmm. What do you think are the opportunities in beauty that mainstream is either not aware of or not simply just not reaching for? Yeah, I think um, the, the great thing about just sort of the economics of, of beauty is that it's an industry that really thrives on newness, right? So people, I mean, just like yourself as, as a, oh, you know, hoarder, if you will, of beauty products, <laughs> you know, you all want what's next, what's new, what's, what's that? <laughs> and, you know, so, so that's, that I think, so just by, by um, just, um, just naturally, there are opportunities to discover new like subcategories in beauty. I mean, you see that in hair, mm -hmm. where traditionally it's about shampoos and conditioners, right. but for women who are natural, now it's like about the pre-poo. And what am I going right. to do before I wash my hair? What right. product do I put on my hair before I actually, right. you know, um, begin my begin my routine and um, and then certainly oils are wow. um, really making their way um, and we talk wow. yes yes and, and the great thing about oils is that the combinations are just endless oh and the, the medicinal pro um, properties yes. are just endless um, and we kind of talked about like the five big trends that um, we're seeing. And, and last year when we did it, we were spot on. Um, when we did it in 2019 for 2020, we said one big emerging trend was beauty and wellness. Yes. And in 2019, it wasn't quite there. But can you imagine beauty and wellness now? I mean, it's, 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 it's like a core part of um, beauty. Um, I think one opportunity is that multitasking products. Um, I think this whole idea of like an 11 step routine, sort of like that, the K beauty standard, I just don't see that being sustainable, mm -hmm. right? Like people are busy. They, 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 they want options, et cetera. So multitasking products, both within skin and makeup and hair. Yeah. Um, and you see that, you know, brands that are able to create you know, multifunctional products, they tend to do very well. Um, scalp therapy is one where I feel like, you know, it's, I mean, you're seeing more options out there, but scalp yeah. therapy is part of self care. You know, um, you know, people can even like going into certain salons to get your scalp massage. It, it creates, it's part of like this whole wellness uh, movement. Um, so those were some key areas. Um, one one uh, area, and actually one of our members, um, she just launched a fantastic brand that just launched at um, Sephora. She um, It's LYS Beauty, um, which is clean cosmetics, which I think is just an area that's just naturally going to grow. Yeah. Yeah. If people love clean um, skincare as much as they, um, you know, if, if they value clean beauty as much as they, I mean, clean cosmetics as much as clean skincare, then I think that's a segment that you're definitely going to see high growth because um, it just makes sense. Like if you actually care what you wash your face with, you should right. care what sits on your face for hours and hours and hours, right? <laughs> right. So, yeah. So I think um, especially with foundations and lipstick and mascara, yeah. um, um, those are all clean categories that are ripe for innovation, for sure. Well, listen, the dirty stuff has been making a killing for us. Yeah, <laughs> for I know, right? So you're well, like, keep it dirty, so the we can come and fix it. Um, but yes. <laughs> I love that um, you predicted well in advance the, um, you know, the trend of beauty merging with wellness. Um I, I just may be a bit of an old soul, but I have always thought that beauty and wellness are completely on the same spectrum. It's yeah. just, you know, how far or how deep you're willing to go. So my yeah. whole, you know, MO and yeah. the basis of my practice is that, you know, it's hard to have beauty without wellness. So yeah. I may speak the language of beauty again with a needle, a syringe or a scalpel, but it's founded upon a very fundamental concept of wellness, right? Yeah. Things that got to work on the inside to help me help you manifest your beauty on the outside. So for me, 
beauty and wellness have always sort of been along the same continuum. So I congratulate you for amplifying yeah. that message. Yeah, yeah. That's really important. No, it is, it is. And I think there are um, opportunities for brands that are more unapologetic in being purpose-driven. Yeah. Just like Fenty came along and they were unapologetic about oh, their yeah. shade range. Yeah. I think brands need to embrace, you know, their purpose and talk about love. And for those brands that are, you know, are, are willing to, they take it up a step further and talk about like, if you have a strong Christian faith, I mean, you have brands out there that are willing to pull that into what they create. I mean, um, so I, I think purpose-driven brands are really going to see um, a great deal of growth as well. And it's also part of, you know, the whole authenticity conversation. Absolutely. Right? If, if yeah. being a Christian product, whatever that means to you, is, yeah. is your thing, if that's your truth, put it out there. Yeah, yeah, exactly. There's somebody there, who's going to there, love it. There's an audience out there. There are people <laughs> who will gravitate towards that, you know? So, um, yeah, yeah. Excellent. Thank you for listening to part one of my interview with Ella Gorgla on the Forever Fab podcast. Stay tuned for part two. You've just listened to part one of Forever Fab podcast. Please stay tuned for part two coming up next.